Yo, yo, yo! With the rear now built up a bit, it is time for us to move on. We've been hatching a plan and I think this will open new doors for us and we see it as a window of opportunity. Stick around, because this could be a really punny episode. Dish. We took delivery of the windows a very long time ago, but now it was time to have a bit of a closer look at them. We wanted to see how they're constructed and how they're mounted on the box. We also wanted to check that we understood the documentation and all that stuff. We've unwrapped the windows and doors and had a quick look at them and they all look absolutely fantastic. I've had a look in the uh, installation manuals and I've got the aperture sizes and wrote them down for each of them so we don't forget. Uh, the aperture sizes are the inside dimensions which means we need to determine a cut li list and add on the extra material for the 45 degree mitres. And that's what I've got down here. And I've left nice little space here so that you can tick them off and cut them. Mm. Now I know what we're cutting. I'm gonna go out there and get dirty. You get it. <laughs> And whilst she's doing the hard work and has already done the really hard work with the brain, I'm going to take these metal sticks here and put them under the saw there. And hopefully I will be able to tick off the bingo card that she's made for me there. What is it that you say on YouTube? Click like and subscribe. No, no, that me, not that me. Don't do that. No, wait. Do that. But the the is it let's do this or what? What's it? Let's do this. Let's do this. Or something. Let's work. There on the table we have material for the five apertures. That's four pieces each. That's 20. There is two mitres per stick. So that is 40 mitres that has been cut and dressed up and also adjusted so that my inner perfectionist can just zip it. The next step is to use the fourth state of material and just fuse them together. 
I'm trying to set up a clamping solution that'll work for all sizes of the frames. My limited experience says that you can overdo the clamping and then nothing bad happens and you think that overdoing it was pointless as nothing bad happened. Then one day you're a bit too lazy and you cut down on the clamping and you end up with a Picasso painting and then you're annoyed at yourself. So you overdo the clamping again but it still feels a bit pointless. Anyway, I think I found a good solution and I must say that I love the Fireball tool welding squares. They've made my fabric cobbling life so much easier. The aperture frames are now welded together. I still need to weld the insides of them and the outsides of them but as an excuse I ran out of argon. Sunday evening at 6 o'clock I think is a good time to uh, run out of argon so I can uh, stop working. As I said in the previous clip, I ran out of argon and we went to get a new bottle yesterday and then it took me about 24 hours to recover from the price shock. So now when I have blanked that out of my life, I can continue welding the frames. I've ground down the welds and I have also removed as much rust as I can from those. Some other parts are quite rusty. Uh, I still have the big one to do. Before I do the last one, the big one, I thought I would put some rust converter on the ones I've done. Anyway, let me put the white goo on it and watch it turn black. Oh, but it was Bono. <laughs> Morning. <laughs> As the crazy Kaz is there playing around with the angry end, erasing some of my mistakes, thank you, I have been pondering on what to do next. In fact, we spent a long time yesterday figuring out how to get the roof to the roof. Actually up there, up there, way up there. The roof is going to be two meters ish from here. And my plan was slash is slash slash might be 
that I'm building the roof in the garage and then we put it up. So the problem is that we don't know how heavy the roof is going to be and uh, if it's very heavy it's going to be quite a challenge getting it up there without breaking either us or something else. We thought of building it upside down with the walls, the legs, uh, and then flipping it upside down and then putting it up there, but uh, we kind of discarded that one. And then there's various other thoughts and ideas that we have contemplated and mostly discarded. And I think the conclusion from yesterday's uh, head scratching was that uh, Let's just build the roof and see what happens. Pretty much. There are too many unknowns if we don't do it. Down there I have four sticks, the sides and the front and back, and I need to chamfer the ends of them and put them together. And that should be the perimeter of the whole roof. Then it needs reinforcing and at some point I need to add the aperture for the vent at the front and the hatch at the back. Let's see where this ends up. Let's raise the roof. Whoop, whoop. Mm, no. Welcome to another clamping intermission. I here have two sticks that are uh, 3660 ish millimeters long. Uh, one of them is actually one millimeter longer than the other one. I don't know if it is uh, which direction the, the discrepancy is, but to try to get them the same length, I have clamped this weird square, monster square here, whatever it's called. That should ensure that these ends are now parallel in the same spot. And then at the other end, I have clamped these minion squares like this. And then I used my 3D printed angle square to position the top there so that that one is correct and you can see there that there's a slight discrepancy in the in the uh, length of them but thanks to having this face here and on the side there i can now use this one on this side here this one on the other side so that should ensure that when i scribe these 45 degrees here, they should be at the same location. My limited experience with fabric cobbling and uh, just screwing things up in general is that uh, precision never comes at the end of a project. Things go wrong in stages and the wrongness increases as you go along. So I'm trying to make at least the perimeter of the roof fairly accurate. Anyway. Let's uh, get scribing and marking and then cutting and doing things. So, anyway, end of the uh, clamping intermission. All the ends are now chamfered, 
I think I am going to use the MIG welder on this just because of the size of this and it's a bit cumbersome. A comfortable tigging position with a pedal and all that stuff could be... Yeah, I don't think that's going to work very well. Before I weld, I need to chamfer at least the top and the bottoms uh, so that uh, we get proper penetration. No giggling in the back there. Then I'm going to try that uh, saying that uh, three points is a plane. So I'm going to prop these up in three points, not more because of reasons and sciencing. I also figured out that I'll do two L's and then I connect the L's together at the opposite sides. That worked well with the apertures that I did. It was one that I didn't do that way and that one went a little bit wonky. Wish me luck, this is kind of important. Like I said, first we need to chamfer the top and bottom of each end. Once that's done, we'll do the three points as a plane thingy. Thanks to the Fibal tool Mega Square, it's quite easy to clamp the L piece together. As long as it's clamped well and the bar can rotate to align itself, then we should be tickety boo. An extra thick piece of metal will assist in the pearl on this. Then it's just tack welding. Oh, did I say just? I hadn't figured out how to do the tack welds on the underside, so I had to lift the whole thing up. Nice work, Einstein. And then we repeat the process for the other one. Let's turbo boost past the repetition. Now we need to align it all up. Luckily I have a 4 meter by 2.5 meter super flat welding table. Um, no I don't. I have two rickety sawhorses, a folded ladder and a self-built welding table. We'll make it work. Getting the clamping right took a very long time. Somehow this size suddenly makes everything more difficult. And before tack welding it, we need to make sure that it's square. We couldn't find a measuring tape long enough, but luckily we remembered that we had a laser measuring device. Just for the record, it measures lengths, not lasers. Now how do we point the laser accurately from corner to corner? Mm, yeah, that was a bit of a hassle too. Once we had taken way too many measurements, we figured that we needed to adjust the squareness a tad, so we strapped a ratchet strap diagonally across the frame. A few clicks and some more measurements and it kinda seemed right. Then I had Kaz do the science to figure out what the hypotenuse should be. And to our surprise, we had managed to make it square. Well, as far as we could tell. A slow-mo victory dance spontaneously erupted in the workshop. Now I just had to weld it. First corner, no problem. But then, uh, mm, we seem to have a ratchet strap going across the room. What do we do now? Brute force to the rescue. We just tilted the welder underneath and dragged it to the other side. Where were we? Oh yeah, welding. Easy peasy. With the tack welds in place, I could remove all obstacles and turn the welder up to 11. Or rather, push one button to max and the other one to 2. And then I could burn it all in like a pyromaniac. And just like a USB connector, we needed to take the frame out and turn it around and put it back in again so I could weld the bottom side. Easy peasy, squeeze the lemon, we have a roof frame. In a moment of pride, I sent this photo to a friend of mine. He immediately took up the noughts and crosses challenge and we had a good game. That is, until he said, you've got to think outside the box. To which I replied, good point, and swept home the victory. Years of playing Calvin Ball has sharpened my intellect. I decided that the truck wasn't sparkly enough. So I spent a couple of hours this morning with the Glitter Maker 5000 to make things a bit more bling. And what did you discover? Some aeration holes. Well, we do not need aeration holes. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Anytime. Do you like the sparkle? Yes, you look very <laughs> unicorny. <laughs> now, what we also have done is we have put the roof frame, that's that contraption there, on top of the truck, and it mostly fits, right? Yeah. I've also spent the morning uh, trying to figure out where the apertures go exactly. We've had some discussions about this in the past, and uh, now it's time that we actually determine for reals where it goes. My next step is to mark out uh, where the uh, fan aperture goes and the roof hatch aperture goes. And then I need to try to um, add a little bit more strength to this structure. And you can go back to looking fabulous in the glitter. Super darling. <laughs> Later.
I'm going to try to talk to you whilst Kaz is banging on the background there. I put the hatch and the vent aperture on here just to give a bit of a visual uh, reference of what things are going to look like because they are the only absolutely must have fixed positions on the roof. I've taken the, the vent one off which is over there and I've got the hatch one is still there. To start to strengthen this up I'm starting with two bars in the middle and then I'll see where we go from there. But I do know that we need to strengthen the center. The other part that we need to strengthen is towards the back. So I have marked where the two beefy uprights would go up to there. I think we're about ready to weld bzz bzz with the Spatter Maker 5000. Yesterday I managed to weld two sticks. So today I'm going to try to weld more sticks. And my current plan is that I will clamp one of the apertures in place somehow and then I will finagle and uh, shape some sticks to go into the permanent position of it. I think that way I can get the apertures where they should be and then I can basically focus on tying it all together, you know, like a rug ties a room together or something like that to make sure that everything is as sturdy as possible but still maintaining some form of lightweightness. I've put the aperture in its correct position. This is the roof hatch aperture and I've done that by clamping a fireball tool square to here and a plate there to extend it and a similar thing there. So now I have the flat plane location of it and these ones are here to locate the vertical plane. And having looked at this and marked a few critical points, this one here is the upright on the side of the MOG and this one is the upright on the back. This is the big beefy ones on the side of the spare wheel well. Connecting them is probably a good idea. On the other side that's pretty easy. It's open landscape. We can just uh, make a motorway straight through there. No, not motorboat. Motorway. This side is a little bit more complicated. There's a hatch in the way there. What I'm going to do now to help my brain get to the next stage is that I'm going to put a sim simple stick between the back there and the one in the middle-ish there. That way I have halved the problem and this side is one problem and the other side is another problem that I will deal with separately. Another episode from Inside Yoka's Head. Stick, 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 sticky, sticky, stick, stick. Another episode of Inside Kaz's Head. <laughs>before I've even started there are concerns that this is going to be too heavy. Yeah I can understand that. Metal is usually associated with heavy structures but uh, when you use the right-ish material you can do quite a lot especially if you arrange it in the correct way. Here, you see that? It's a bar. It is 1583 millimeters long. So it's just over one and a half meters long. And here's the scale. I hope you can see that. 1943 grams. So this stick is less than two kilos. And the key here is that it is a fairly thin walled material. When the roof structure is finished I'm hoping to have used primarily this stuff. The perimeter is of the thicker 40 by 40 by 3 millimeter stuff. 
and uh, unfortunately that adds a lot of weight. However, it also provides a very sturdy perimeter. Those two bars that are going across there, they are 40 by 20 by 2. This one is 40 by 20 by 1.5, so a little bit lighter. And the reason those ones are the sturdier stuff is just because of the span. A little bit of a sidetrack about the weight. With the centerpiece now welded in place over there, I have decided to connect the rear upright through the hatch. So this is 45-ish degrees across to the hatch there, and then going to continue that with this 45-ish degrees over to there. And then I'll probably put another 45-ish degrees thingy at the front there to connect the potential upright. I don't know if this is uh, required, or if it's a good idea, but it kind of feels nice. Oh, and uh, just to, the clamping situation is sort of that I'm using this big bar to keep the height of it. And this one also put the trestle sawhorse there to, to minimize any bending of the, the, on the length here and the big length. Um, so, yeah, maybe I'll add a few more clamps before I start. Bzz, 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 bzz. But that's the theory, that's the idea, that's the plan right now. It looks like today was three and a half times as efficient as yesterday. Because yesterday we managed two sticks. And today we've managed seven. As you can see, triangulation is president. That white spot there on the perimeter is where the uprights for the spare wheel carrier might go. So everything is designed to counteract sideways movement and outwards backwards movement on that one. Before we fill in the blanks over there and in there, I think it would be a good idea to position the roof vent hole here. Well, that's another day because now it is almost seven o'clock on a Sunday, so I'm gonna take it easy now. What you done today? Cleaned up a lot of metal, dirt grinded, a lot of welds, and Jenny got really mucky. More fun another day. Something like that. <laughs>
I'm starting the day by positioning the halves of the fireball tool magic squares at the edge of the roof vent. I then attach an aluminium plate underneath so I can stack some fireball tool magnetic shim blocks to space the aperture out the correct distance. This way I don't have to measure it and I know that if clamped tightly the distance will be spot on. Sometimes I feel like clamping is a mix of playing with Lego techniques and an intelligence test. With the aperture in place it's time to engage the brain and try to figure out where the sticks go that's to hold the aperture in place. Visual aids such as more sticks is a good help. Then we also take some measurements from the truck so that we can mark out where the uprights are and anything else that might be useful or in the way. We then go and fetch the door aperture and the two window apertures and place them in their rough position. Again we're trying to visualize where we can connect things to or where we shouldn't put any sticks in. There's obviously a lot of thinking happening here. A lot of thinking and staring and thinking, moving sticks and thinking and staring. What I'm trying to do here is to visualize how the forces are pushed and pulled around. We can quite safely assume that the majority of the motion is going to be side to side. Then there's going to be forward and backwards lurching but also suspension travel up and down. I'm trying to connect any point that's got such movement to another point. All this was trying to maintain triangulation. The triangulation part is important because it's the strongest shape where each side is either in tension or compression. I want to avoid parallel sticks as they are very weak and allow for a lot of movement. So in my head I'm connecting the stress points with other stress points with triangular shapes. And then, like a thought in a brain, I think I have an idea. Let's continue the center bar. That means adding one bar between the side to side bars and then adding another one forward to the vent hatch. It's an easy and cheap idea, but the central bar will help me divide the problem into smaller pieces. Instead of two open areas I now have four smaller ones that I can deal with individually. With the center bar in place I then thought it would be a good idea to attach the hatch at the front. In other words two angled bars were massaged into shape and tack welded in between the front of the hatch and the perimeter frame. And then back to thinking. Where should the next sticks go? And what's their relation to the other sticks? More visual aids, more thinking. There it is again, another thought. Crazy stuff. Let's put a zigzag in between the two side to side bars. That'll keep me off the streets for a little while longer. Four more sticks were prepared in no time at all. Or that's what it looks like in a time lapse. The process should be familiar by now. Clean the weld spots, clamp everything in place with an excessive amount of clamps, tack weld it in place. With a zigzag in place it's now pretty obvious that bracing to the zigzag points from the hatch corners is probably a good idea. Let's actionate this blue sky thinking with a magical synergy potion. A few time lapse frames later we're cleaning welding spots and clamping metal sticks. Lovely. Bzz, bzz, bzz. And we're done for today. Got to save some work for tomorrow too. <laughs>
I'm quite pleased with the result. I hope I haven't overdone the overdoing too much. As you know, that tends to happen. The next thing we need to do is to fully weld all the seams and then grind the welds down, especially on the top so that the roof can go on there so that it is flat. Let's hope that it is strong enough in the vertical direction. I think that in the horizontal direction it is plenty strong. The design, I think, is done. And so am I. So, enough. Till the next clip. Good morning boys and girls, another wonderful day here, except there's a lot of wind, the welding gas might not uh, stay where it should be staying, so uh, let's give it a go and see if it works, it's about 10 degrees C, so it's not the most comfortable of days either, so, but uh, yeah, let's just see if we can get stuff done instead of talking about it. I hope you enjoyed me welding under a sheet in the wind considering how much wind there was and my angle of attack I think that the welds have turned out quite well I have added quite a lot of fillet welds on the sides and that basically means that uh, uh, we'll have to grind some of that off professional welders would probably not have done that but luckily I'm not professional so Cass is gonna come out and uh, erase my mistakes later Hello boys and girls, today the crazy and I have been measuring and debating and measuring more and debating more about how to do the next steps. One of the issues that we have been trying to solve here is where can we put uprights between the floor and the roof? Because we don't know exactly what the interior is going to look like, we don't want to specify exactly where the windows go just yet. We want there to be a little bit of a adjustment room for that. So trying to figure out exactly where we can put uprights that are useful and not in the way of the windows when we move them around has taken quite a lot of brain capacity and with a small brain it takes a long time. However the measurements have also confirmed a few things. Uh, first of all I did not make this one uh, super duper straight. I don't know if that straightness has come after my welding or from my welding or where it's come from, but there is a discrepancy between this point and the center point and the other point. I think we can solve it, I think we can work around that thanks to the door frame being here. We have also confirmed what I kind of knew from previous measurements that this uh, outrigger is not super duper perpendicular to the other parts. Something that doesn't matter in the grand build, but we need to take it into account when we are making decisions like this. There is going to be an upright from the front there, all the way up to the roof there. But because of the discrepancies there, I don't want to put that one in just yet. I'll put that in later. But to keep the roof up for now, we have decided that one upright will go here and the other one will go here. On the driver's side, we will put one upright on the front and another upright at outrigger one. Outrigger two we will skip for now and the second one will be at outrigger three. There's going to be a kitchen window here, so the strongest one, which is the out 
rigger 2 is now going to be unused for a little while. Again, we have the window frames here on top of the truck to give us a little bit of an idea how much space they will take and all that stuff. The other thing that we have been calculating is how high the uprights need to be. We have set a target of 190 centimeters of indoor space, maybe 195. And we come to the conclusion that the closer to 190, but above 190, the better. Now the issue here is that we don't know the exact thickness, thicknesses of what is going to go between the current bottom of the floor and the current top of the roof. We know things like that we want 60 millimeters of insulation, top and bottom, but we do not know, for example, the floor thickness or floor material or anything like that. We don't know the interior ceiling cladding thickness or material. So we've had to guess a little bit and make some form of a error margin baked into the height. If we are to go with the current calculations, then the internal height will be 1907 millimeters. Uh, it won't, but in theory. That means that conveniently we have rounded things up and down a little bit so that the uprights will be exactly two meters. And when I say exactly, I mean as close as possible. In practical terms, that means that we need to cut five pieces of two meter length pieces of 40 by 20 millimeter box section. That's kind of the wrap up for today. This is the part that YouTubers usually don't show. I think it's important to convey that we spend a lot of time doing things that aren't cool. At this stage where you are talking about things and you are thinking about things, you can take as much time as you want to do this because when you figure this out and you put it into action, you made, make something out of wood or steel, at that point it's really difficult to change it. So now is the time to debate all possible permutations and decide on which ones you go for. So hopefully that's been a productive day for us. Hopefully the next clip will be more action, more YouTube. We're having a bit of a fractured day here today with various minor things happening at the same time. Uh, we cut uh, the five uprights to roughly two meters. Give or take <laughs> half a millimeter. Yeah. So we're happy with the height of them and now Kaz got the short straw of cleaning the rust off them. Kaz also figured out that there are brackets on the cab there that we potentially could use to uh, hold the roof uh, temporarily whilst we get the uprights in place. So thanks for that idea, Kaz. That's brilliant. And here's another one of Kaz's masterpieces. She's been applying rust converter onto the roof frame. At the moment it's drying on this side, so we'll need to flip it over and do the other side once more. So now, thanks to Kaz's brilliant idea of using the brackets on the cab, I think I need to start taking some measurements and see if we can make a bracket. I've uh, got some scrap metal pieces and I've made these short ones, four of those, with some M8 holes in them, and then I use these ones here. Well, we're going to slide the roof onto. Uh, now, the next step is to tack well these onto here and then I need to determine the exact height of it so that uh, we get it in a good spot. Uh, I think the best way to do this is to actually leave it slightly short. That means that when we put the uprights in, we are lifting it up and the weight is fully on the uprights. Otherwise, they would be, you know, otherwise the uprights would be too short and the roof would get wonky.
Okay, boys and girls, we have the temporary roof supports there, as was Kaz's idea. I fabric cobbled them yesterday. On the bed here, we have some plywood. We have also marked out all the five locations for the uprights, both on the truck bed and on the roof. We have three braces there. We have three braces down there. We have the uprights over there ladders and step stools uh, we have tons of clamps and other implements that might help us stabilize this contraption once it's up there we have straps we have secured the bump a little bit there so that it doesn't get damaged and that probably means that it is time to cue the Benny Hill music and let you watch the circus because this is going to be full of clowns. Here we go. With three people moving the roof around, it's no problem. All we now have to do is scoot it up on the artist formerly known as the flatbed, then lift it up, right? I added some big zip ties to the temporary front supports, just to make sure that the roof doesn't jump off by mistake. We added some prongs to one of the uprights so that we could use it to scoot up the rear end. No, not like that, just lift it. For good measure, we added another support. It's good to have extra support. Then we started sticking the upper sticks into place. Oh, and we also needed a welder. Next we attach some of the fireball tool, not sponsored squares, to the flatbed so that we can register the uprights in the correct spot. With the marks on the roof, we can pretty easily see where the sticks should be and scoot the roof into the correct-ish position. Then I just need to clamp them in place and bzz bzz bzz. With the two rear ones in place, we started to position the front upright. Again, it was pretty easy to register it in the correct spot, front corner. Simple. The top proved to be a little bit more complicated to clamp, but once I figured out that I should use the Fireball Mega Square, it was easy. Clamping was easy, climbing up there was a little bit harder. Then we moved on to the middle one on the driver's side. Again, very easy. Just locate the stick into the scribed marks and do some basic measurements. Bzz, 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 and done. Then it was time for the final one. This one had a bit of a discrepancy at the bottom, but we knew about that, so using the mega square clamping it was no problem. With all five tack welded in place, I can remove the temporary front supports and the temporary prop too. However, now the tedious work starts. Now we need to stabilize the roof and we need to stabilize it in the correct position. What follows is a long and arduous session of measuring, confirming measurements, and measuring more, and confirming more. The task is not helped by that the original flatbed isn't very straight, nor that we're not on a perfectly flat ground, nor that the whole truck moves when you walk on it. The movements obviously affect the measurements, so I constantly have to move out of the way and stand in the center or as far away from where I'm measuring. We have six bracing sticks. Two on the sides, stabilizing in the front rear direction. Then there's two on the front, which stabilize the roof side to side, but also hold it flat and level due to the passenger side upright missing. The last two braces brace the rear side to side, but because they're attached at a compound angle, they also brace the roof front to back. To force the roof into what we believe is the correct spot, we use ratchet straps. And just like that, it's done. How did you like that circus? I can't believe it worked. But the roof is up. That's a big milestone, obviously. The five uprights are there with six braces holding it in pretty good position. I'm not gonna say perfect because you know who I am. You might see our camping chairs up there. 
we are going to sit down there and admire our handiwork with a little drink. That also means that this episode is now done. And if you thought that we were completely done, then no. There's still a few more details to do before this is a full-fledged camper. So I hope you come join us in the next episode where we continue these shenanigans. Thanks for watching! As you might have noticed, this is the 33rd episode. That means that there's currently 32 other ones to watch. They're all clickbait and sponsor free. And they're organized by tasks, so you can easily watch one that's of interest to you. Here's one that the algorithm thinks that you would like. And the whole playlist. Thanks again for joining us.